Hi there everybody, this is Beanie Undead and here is a guide for players new to the MMO Black Desert, an amazing, dare I say, revolutionary MMO that for some odd reason goes out of its way above and beyond to make itself look generic, shallow and ultimately inferior, especially compared to other MMOs that have come out. It's not the case, but it goes out of its way to look this way as if the devs were like saying, it's not going to sell in the West unless we make it look generic somehow. Make no mistake, it's a masterpiece of a game that is incompetently presented, I would say. The purpose of this guide is to provide an understandable explanation of how to actually start a game of Black Desert, focusing on specifics rather than nebulous generalizations, focusing on a paradigm shift in thought as opposed to, well, outlying how you can engage the crafting system to the greatest degree. So this is for new players, not necessarily for the more experienced ones. Other guides are great for players with experience, but not necessarily for somebody just starting. This guide is my attempt to remedy the situation. This is the guide I would have liked to have had when I first started, and I think it would have made my transition a little bit more enjoyable. First of all, servers. When you first log on, you'll have to pick a server before you even go into character cre creation. There are three main servers, Uno, Orwin, and Eden. Generally speaking, Australians play on Eden, Europe Europeans play on Orwin, and Americans play on Uno. Uh, to be clear, I see many different nationalities on each server. It's not like it's exclusive, but if you look at the large-scale demographics and times of most activity, this is true of the Western servers listed here. Inside each server tab is a list of instances. Unlike in most MMOs, you actually get to choose your instance, and it clearly indicates the population load. It does not matter which you pick, as you can move your character freely between the instances. You cannot, however, transfer characters between server at this stage, so make sure you and your friends are on the same server before you start actually creating characters that you become attached to, and that's very easy to do in this game. Once you're in, you can create your character. There are, at the time of this video, eight classes to choose from, although more will undoubtedly become available considering that Korean and Russian servers apparently have more. The warrior is a male fighter, the Valkyrie is a female fighter, the ranger is a female archer, the berserker is a big male fighter, the sorcerer is a magically sorry, the sorceress is a magically assisted female fist fighter, the tamer is a female pet user, the wizard is a male caster, and the witch is a female caster. Which is one is the tank I hear you say, which one is ranged DPS, which one is the healer. Well, understand you're applying tropes of, a, of MMOs that don't really apply to this game. In Black Desert, it's style you are choosing at this stage of the game, not class restriction. Well, not really, at least. I mean, they there are very specific skills to each, but in a general sense. I mean, uh, I'll explain. Look, yes, obviously the Ranger is going to be better than the Valkyrie at range combat, but the, the Valkyrie is actually quite good at executing medium range attacks at higher levels, and I find that she's actually more effective at range at later levels as well. Uh, the Tamer is just effective as the Wizard, for example, at AoE, Area of Effect Attacks, but her style involves using a beast, usually a giant wolf, as opposed to, well, magic. But basically, it's how you build your character with skills during the game that decides how it plays. So pick the one that looks the most fun for you, the, the great a style, okay? Because I guess what I'm trying to say is anybody can really be AoE, <laughs> or anybody can be the tank. It all just depends on how you build your character, or you're buying a skill that you find intuitive. Next is your appearance. This is great fun, so take your time with this and experiment. However, there are a few things to note. First of all, you cannot change your gender. If you choose a ranger, you are female. If you choose the warrior, sometimes known as the blader, you are male. Second, the lower left side of the screen contains the weather indicator. This exists to change the lighting for character generation only. It does not reflect any in-game content. Second, there is a star sign option. At the moment, it serves very little in the way of function. Apparently, it can affect certain conversations options in the late game, but I am personally yet to see an example of this, and I've gone quite quite far into the late game, so, so yeah. Third is the lower right tab, which contains poses and clothing. Again, this serves the none of these options serve any in-game purpose. They exist to allow you to preview how your character looks while emoting and to show you what he or she will look like in different clothes, but that is it. The, uh, the clothing your character wears, for example, at the start of the game does not appear here. Everything important in character generation is done in the upper right tab, which includes an overwhelming myriad of customization options. Note that in the face sub-tab, just a few things, you can edit your standby expression. 
careful here because your character enters standby every time you stop walking or change the camera to look at your character from the front. This means if you pick a broad grin or a snarl, it can get a bit creepy during the game. Seriously, there's nothing weird to having your character just grinning profusely up at you every time you want to look at them from the front. A neutral expression is what I'd actually recommend, even though you're probably <laughs> going to be tempted not to do that. Note also that the, that in the body sub-tab, uh, down the bottom, there is an edit pose option. Seriously, ignore this completely. It serves absolutely no function. The poses you create, no matter how amazing they are or how perverse, <laughs> will never appear in the game, so don't waste your time. Uh, finally, remember also that as soon as you have named your character, actually this is very important, so please, if uh, <laughs> this, this really stuffed me up the first time, remember that as soon as you have named your character, you automatically finalize it, locking in your current look. So be careful, if you decide to enter your name first, you'll be stuck with the default look because it will basically finalize your character as opposed to entering the name and letting you, well, customize it after that. It's kind of like, oh, I've got my character's name, now I'll decide what they look like. No, don't do that. Uh, it gets more frustrating when you realize that it can take up to 24 hours for a deletion request to be pro processed, which prevents you from using the same character name again for that period. So it means that this perfect name that you came up with that in, has been locked now into this character you don't want because the appearance is locked in. So yeah, you can't reuse the name, which is even more... Um, frustrating. So remember, adjust your look, then choose a name. So there you go. So you press start and watch the cryptic and rather odd introduction. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. Like it or hate it, there is a story here. It's interesting, I guess, but it's up to you. Anyway, then the game begins with your character waking up after being possessed by a black spirit. Before I go into this, a couple of housekeeping points. First of all, as soon as you're able to, and keep in mind the escape key won't work at first, the black spirit will guide you through like a compulsory tutorial at the very beginning. You'll also notice you don't have a mini-map, you've got to basically quest until your mini-map appears. However, as soon as you are able, okay, uh, make sure you go into your settings by pressing escape and clicking on the settings tab. There's a whole heap of options here, it's right down the bottom. Begin the process of optimizing your graphics, and this is what I would actually suggest. First of all, make sure you turn blood on. Uh, that's if you like blood, of course, in the options. Uh, it's, a, it's a really cool part of the game, but it starts default off for most systems. And also ensure you know the difference in quality between high-end mode and normal mode. Next thing you need to do as early as possible is to activate all quest types. You see, while the designers, designers of Black Desert are a talented bunch, they, as I explained earlier, seem obsessed with convincing everyone that the game is a boring grind fest with no depth. So much so they actually hide their good content from you and attempt to make the world seem more linear, shallow and non-engaging. Again, why would they do this? God only knows, but they have all the non-grind quests switched off as the default at the beginning of the game. Not only This not only means that the main quest indicators will not show on the map, but it also means that if you talk to an NPC with a quest, one of these other types of non-grind quests, he will not provide any indication that he even has a quest because you have not switched them on. Okay, so to switch them on, click on your quest tab. Okay, you basically you press control and move the move the mouse over to the, the quest tab over here on the right side of the screen then go up to the splash screen and click this button okay there you go you are ready to go now <sighs> so you just started the you just started the black spirit is talking you through a brief tutorial on movement most people suffer here because this opening looks almost identical to many traditional MMOs, starting you straight away in a linear sequences, a sequence of connected quests. As a consequence, most players just follow this line of quests blindly, leaving the starting town almost immediately in pursuit of the Black Spirit's objective. Do not do this. The Black Spirit quests are interesting and helpful, but they are not supposed to be followed to the exclusion of the world around you. This is why there's no urgency to them. Uh, the Spirit literally says at one stage, wouldn't it be interesting to kill some foxes? You don't need to follow its instructions or pursue what it considers to be interesting. In fact, there's a kind of this weird side to the game where you're not really sure whether the Black Spirit is on your side. It's turning you into a bit of a psychopath. So there you go. Um, the problem, of course, is compounded by the fact that most players don't even have the other quest turned on at this critical first impression stage. So everybody thinks it's incredibly linear and you just you leave the first town thinking it's this empty, empty subpar starting area and it and it actually isn't so now comes the big revelation this game is not 
a quest-based MMO. It is a playground MMO. Some call it a sandbox, some call it a true open world game, some even call it a fantasy life simulator, but it's definitely not a World of Warcraft like Let's Jump on the Rides theme park MMO. So here's the breakdown of the differences, and this is the paradigm shift I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to explain to you. This is, this is a different way you've got to look at this game. In a theme park MMO like WoW, everything exists as a component of long, a long corridor of attractions, where every event and every progression happens in a specific order. When do I get my first mount? Level 15. When can I begin raiding? When you reach this place and have a specific level. Uh, I want to kill the little frail looking bird over there. Don't, it's two levels higher than you, it will destroy you and your soul. A playground or sandbox MMO, however, like Black Desert, is defined by its open world. Let's go through the same questions that I just asked, okay? When do I get my first mount, for example? Well, you get given one by an NPC later, but you can buy, and at no specific level, it's when you encounter this NPC. A lot of people encounter him around level 15, I guess, but at the same time, that's, that's just coincidence. I've known players who encounter him around about level 5. Um... Yeah, you can actually buy a horse at level 1 if you have the cash. Uh, can I get the cash by this stage? Actually, yes, in a number of different ways, like trading, grinding, crafting. I mean, how much do mounts cost? Well, again, it depends. Horses that have been bred cost an amount dictated by other players, so they prices can vary. Stock horses can cost as low as 15,000 silver. In fact, no, actually, I'll change that. Uh, as low as 10,000 silver, I've seen them, uh, which is about 30 minutes or less of grinding. Where can I begin raiding is the next question. Well, as soon as you find something to fight join a group and you can participate immediately can i kill all can i kill things out of my level area without dying dying instantly yeah the game is what we call a player skill responsive game meaning skill play can allow you to best creatures far above your level uh, note that creatures not that creatures have a specific level well technically they do but they just have a way of fighting that can prove difficult for less experienced players. But go for it and experiment, that's the bottom line. Like, I do find some fights hard, but I love fighting above my level. It's a great way of farming XP. But anyway, uh, so the advice uh, here is don't just follow the core Black Spirit quest at the start. If you do, you'll be engaging in a linear quest, kill quest after linear kill quest after linear kill quest until you get bored. So what do you do instead? Well, roleplay, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So you've just woken up with amnesia and realized that you have something everybody else does not, the power to gain combat prowess unlike ever before. You're basically a mentally defunct superhero assisted by what appears to be an, omnipi an omniscient um, spirit. So yeah, uh, any normal person under these circumstances would go around and familiarize him or herself with their surroundings. Could basically kind of say, okay, where am I? What uh, Do I recognize any of these people? Like even soul searching or something. So that's what you do first. Ignore the black spirit quest and run around the town. On your minimap, you'll see a cone of vision in front of you. Once you unlock the minimap. Now keep in mind, what you've got to do is you've got to go through the missions, the starting tutorial. Follow the black spirit until your minimap appears. And that's pretty much when he'll say, let's leave the starting town. And you go, no. No, no, I'm going to stay in the starting town. So, so stick around and play the missions until your minimap appears. Now, on your minimap, after it's appeared, you will see your cone of vision. In front of you, in that cone, you'll see question marks. These are NPCs that have something significant to say. Talk to them all. This will take a while, as you'll have to find them. The game does not hold your hand here. You'll have to go and search the town, and some of them are kind of just on the outskirts of town, they're non-intuitively placed, etc. But yeah, this activity will reveal many of the initially hidden functions of the first town. Some of them will have quests. Sometimes these quests will be indicated on the minimap with an exclamation mark. Other times, you'll have to talk to a person randomly to do the quests. Uh, to do, uh, do them or save them for later, or ignore them completely. It's your character. Do what you want. But... I hear you say, wait a minute, it's all about experience, right? Do all the quests, that way I can level up. Quests equal XP, right? Because that's what's normally the case in an MMO. Well, no, they don't. They give you what's called contribution points. Contribution points would be, in my opinion, better named reputation points, or renown, or my wife gave me a really good one, influence, okay, or even local acceptance points. Uh, but you can use them to accomplish things within the area that locals would never allow a stranger to do, basically. So as you do things for people, they will say, ah, oh, we accept you in our community, basically. Things like buying a house, you use contribution points for that, and money, of course. 
but the ability to actually unlock the, well sorry the unlo the, the uh, unlocking the ability to buy a house um, actually costs contribution points uh, there are other functions for contribution points and I'm serious there's heaps like you can rent special weapons and all sorts of things but I'll talk about them later in a different context just wait a bit for that but yeah you are not going to power level your character by smashing quests quite the opposite actually Anyway, as you run around town talking to people, you will accumulate knowledge. Knowledge of the people, knowledge of the places. Okay, this will give you topics of conversation which you can use to get to know the NPCs in more detail, forming friendships and even romantic relationships with NPCs. The more you get to know a character, the more stuff they will give you, including extra quests, special items, knowledge of their trade, etc. You get to know characters by clicking on the conversations tab. It'll be grayed out at first until you know enough about their world to actually have a conversation with them beyond, say, commenting on the weather. Uh, but when you do click on them, you'll enter into a highly confusing, totally abstract and ambiguous conversation minigame. There is so much false or misleading information on this minigame out there, and the game designers made what is actually a very cool concept into something that is horribly vague. Oh, this was so frustrating for me. It's, it's great now that I know how it works, so here's how it works for you in advance. Okay, so... You're, you're running around town, you're talking to people, and now you've got enough knowledge to actually have a conversation with them. And this screen appears. Alright, the pattern in the middle of the screen is the target's star sign or horoscope. It is basically a symbolic representation of his or her personality. The more circles in the horoscope, the harder it is to keep them engaged in the conversation. You fill the circles with knowledge of people, places, and things, essentially mapping out the topics of your coming conversation on the symbolic representation of their personality. How do you know about people, places, and things this person may be interested in? Well, NPCs are usually interested in current affairs and gossip, meaning that if you have gotten to know all the people in your area, chances are that you will have a lot to talk about. So in other words, the more people you know, the easier this becomes. Also, NPCs are usually, but not exclusively, interested in people they personally know, meaning merchants will want to talk about other merchants, guards will want to talk about guards, etc. The game will actually tell you when you've gotten to know all of the different people in a specific professional or social group and will award you energy for your effort. More energy very soon, but yeah, you get, you get something for actually completing a knowledge set. So, we now know how hard it is to keep them interested, the number of circles in the star sign, and you know that you need to have knowledge of different people, places, and things in order to be able to have something to talk about. And the knowledges you possessed are displayed in this revolving semicircle on the bottom of the screen. The more the better, especially for NPCs with a large number of horoscopes to fill. Horoscope circles to fill, sorry. Uh, now comes the picky, uh, now comes how picky and egotistical the character is. This is displayed at the top left of the screen uh, with, in the form of an interest score. The higher the NPC's interest, the more picky they are about who you might want to talk about. Just because you know 20 people or have knowledge of 20 people does not mean that he or she will want to talk about any of them. Personally, I would have renamed interest as pickiness or ego or self-absorption or something, I don't know, uh, egocentricness, uh, anything other than, I don't know, interest, because that's a little misleading. Uh, if you hover your mouse over your knowledge semicircle at the bottom, all these faces of the people you met in your searchings, each one has an interest score of their own. Again, I would have called this sex second interest score something else to, well, make it easier to understand, or at the very least to differentiate it from the other interest score. Uh, I would have called it popularity or shared interest or something, uh, because at the moment the conversation minigame is, usually at least, to select knowledges from this semicircle that have a greater interest level than the NPC you are talking to. So yeah, somebody with a high pickiness will only want to talk about people with higher popularity that makes sense. So basically, click on the faces that have a higher interest score than the interest score of the NPC you are talking to. So I'm going to say that again. Click on the faces that have the higher interest score than the interest score of the NPC you are talking to. If you pick topics of conversation which have a lower interest score than the NPCs, then there is a percentage chance of not sparking their interest during the conversation, and the conversation can fail. Of course, the complexity of this system does not stop there. At the top of the screen, something often missed by even experienced players is your current conversation quest. This will tell you what you're trying to do in the conversation. Now, most of the time you'll be trying to get the NPC to become interested in your topic of conversation by selecting topics from the revolving knowledge semicircle at the bottom of the screen that have a higher interest than the NPC, as I just explained. However, this is not always the case. Sometimes it will say you need to spark interest three times in a row. This means three times in a row you need to have the character interested in what you're talking about. Now, to be clear, this means that you could pass 
you could pass eight times and generate all of this renown. But if you didn't get three in a row, you'll fail the conversation option. So there's these little subtle differences. Other times it will say that you need to fail to spark interest three times in a row. Meaning you need to start picking in a row as many knowledge as you can that have an interest rating below the NPC's interest rating to maximize your chance of actually failing to spark his interest. Other times it will say that you need to generate favor involving this completely different number system called favor which is generated not just by picking uh, information topics which interest the target NPC but also information topics that he or she feels positive towards. It's the same system but instead you're looking for this number as well. Okay, In such a case you need to pick favor scores that that are higher than the NPCs to win. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of that. And people miss the mission at the top, and they just think it's the same thing every single time, and they get frustrated when, hey, hang on a second, I just failed. Why did I fail? Because it pretty much exits you straight away. So what's all this about? Why am I engaging this crazily ambiguous, poorly explained, non-intuitive, overly co uh, complicated, but strangely deep and engaging conversation system with every Tom, Tom, Dick, and Harry in town. Well, as you succeed in the conversation minigame, you generate a score called Amity. As your Amity with NPCs grows, you can unlock different quests, knowledges, personal trade secrets, etc. from that NPC. If you get 100% Amity by filling the wheel completely, which does take a lot of time, you become friends and they will usually pass on something very valuable to them, to you. A cook may pass on his favorite recipe, while a guardsman may teach you a combat skill that is not available on your character's skill list by default. One thing to note here, however, however, true to form, the unlocking of these special friendship perks is confusing. You see, once you have reached the necessary level of amity, you need to exit completely from the interaction screen before re-entering the conversation with the character to get the new quest options, knowledge options, etc. Some players have been known to spend ages bashing through the conversation minigame, only to rage out when the advantage they were promised does not manifest. They often swear and then leave the NPC in disgust, never speaking to them again. Again, and therefore never finding out that their reward is now ready for collection. All they had to do was basically exit and go back in. Again, it's the devs hiding this thing that makes their game great, <laughs> making an ambiguous system seem useless to some people. I don't know why they do it, but yeah, you've got to exit, then go back in again. Uh, there's also another part as well. You'll notice that as you're doing the conversation minigame, these little glowing lights move between different characters on the tree. Now, this is this adds an extra level of complexity to it. Basically, what you're trying to do, well, the, those lights uh, indicate special relationships known to the NPC you're talking to that exist between the different characters or different elements you're talking about. Now the idea is to make it so that you reach the conversation topic, you reach that topic at the time that the the light reaches it, the little glowing orb reaches it. So basically you start talking about the relationship between the two individuals. That yields a special bonus in Amity because you're basically not only sparking their interest by talking some, talking about something they're interested in, you're also giving them new information or gossip on the relationship between two characters. So <laughs> that's basically what's going on there. Now it took me freaking ages to find out that little tidbit of information. But yeah, that's what you're trying to do. So the position of the characters in the actual horoscope matters because you've got to try to coordinate it so that the little lights reach specific points at specific time in co combination with the the quest objectives for the conversation and oh my god yeah have fun with that <coughs> oh my god okay so so you've won <laughs> let's let's move away from conversation now so you've, so you've wandered around town you've seen all the people and sites you probably would have missed if you just followed the main quest okay so now what well seriously now what whatever you want to do but since you're new to the game uh, this is what I would do to start out okay first of all let's press M this is your world map okay for you it should be tiny with a fog covering most of the map but even the bits you can see will look empty other than perhaps the town this is once again completely freaking misleading this is just an example of what the devs are uh, hi how the devs hide their talent and effort let's strike out in a random direction here and see what happens let's go with our brand new character here we're just going to go off in a random direction and begin exploring so here i am following a little bit of advice i received just striking out in a random direction Let's see exactly what we can find. Okay, so we've got this, uh, okay. Yes, I would never have met this young woman. Very, very nice, a potion maker. Very, very cool. 
Got uh, workers here. Apparently all the workers are, uh, are like NPCs working for players, which is... Ooh, who's this? This is pr Croxus! Commander, fight harder! Uh, okay. What am I doing here in the boonies fighting with these <laughs> kids? Alright, so, lots of foxes. Okay, so I found a field of foxes out here. I can actually kill them. So, I don't have to actually be in a specific... Ooh, bush. Okay, what am I doing here? Okay, so you can gather stuff with your bare hands. You don't need tools, necessarily. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh my god, what is that? I found the beach. Wow, this is incredible. Oh my god, those are player ships. I want to own a ship. When do I get a ship? Can I build a ship? Alright, I'm just exploring. Oh my god. This wasn't on the map. So you've really got to uncover parts of the map. Oh wow. I can buy fishing stuff off him. There's people fishing around here. This is amazing. Okay, so exploration is a big part of it. And there's very little hand holding here. So, that was just a sample taken from some footage I collected early in the piece when I was just starting out. For the record, on my travels I discovered, all without these elements being apparent on the map, a fishing spot, a northern trade node, an eastern fishing node, a farm, a militia training yard, and that's not to mention the four NPCs I also encountered on the way, including a trader, a potion master, a fisherman vendor, and a woman in distress. This was all around the starting town and all unflagged by the map. So yeah, explore. And just so you know, I am yet to explore west of the starting town, so God only knows what's there. This map is simply colossal. And I can't wait to explore it myself, so yeah, get into it. There are a few other critical elements of the game that now need to be explained. First of all, you need to know about what the game calls nodes and node masters. A node is just an area of terrain that is significant for some reason, and it has either a static population, some sort of defensive infrastructure, or a continuous flow through of trade traffic. A node master is the person within this area that basically controls, I guess, in inverted commas, although I don't really like that word, the settlement or location, or more accurately, is simply the person you go to to unlock the node. So what is all this about unlocking nodes? Well, to explain it properly, let me first say that the term node is, in my opinion, a poor choice of expression, as is the term node master. Node should be called something more descriptive, like, I don't know, uh, populated points of interest, P PPOIs, or just points of interest, or PO POIs, whatever. The node master, on the other hand, the, the guy or girl in the node, uh, should be called something like the local populaire, or the local information broker, or the local person of influence, or the local bard, or the regional crier, or the local harper, anything, you know, something a little bit more descriptive than node master. But anyway, whatever they're called, node masters are assen essentially the person of most influence in a local community. On a local farm, perhaps the farmer's wife is the node master. In a military outpost, perhaps the senior guard sergeant is the node master. In a trade hub, perhaps the trade master himself is the node master. The point is, they're not necessarily the leaders of the local settlements or points of interest, but they are people you need to make yourself known to if you want word of your deeds to spread beyond where you just did the, the quests that got you all this, all this fame. Node masters are those people, in inverted commas, the people who, the moment you tell them anything, everyone else seems to know about it. They are the gossip queens, the information kings, the jacks of rumour. But, once again, the game likes to downgrade what could be very dramatic, very over-the-top descriptors into node master, you know, very robotic, very mechanical sounding terms that don't really explain what they're all about. So what are node nodes and node masters good for anyway? Well, do you remember how a little while ago I said that questing was not the way to power level your character and that quests themselves only yield contribution points? Well, this is where contribution points come in handy. When you do something for the local community in the form of a quest, you get contribution points as an expression of the settlement's acknowledgement of your deeds. Kind of like a, yeah, we know you did well for us, thank you very much. You can use these points to buy houses in town, etc., which the town would not allow just anyone to do. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't just call, they don't go, thank you for killing those beavers, and now you can buy a house. No, no, you've still got to, uh, to pay for the house, but at least you get permission, you know, the opportunity to buy a house, and stuff like that. However, when you go to a node master and click on the node manager, 
management tab, you get to invest contribution points into a node. This is simply your character identifying him or herself to the local gossip queen or information broker uh, so that this new area recognizes you as a local hero that does stuff for the community. Okay, so they basically allow you to pass your trade to pass through there and they'll say hi as you go past, etc. Nodes, of course, have different investment costs, with military outposts being the most expensive. And this makes sense, you know, the military is going to be a little bit more significant, uh, sorry, suspicious. You've got to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more proactive to impress them. Now, if you jump too far ahead in the node network, the node master of a more distant node will not have heard of your deeds from previous nodes and therefore will not speak well of you to the local people. In other words, you will not be able to invest points such as in such a node because the node before it had no points invested in it and therefore the people there have no, ideas of your, no idea of your deeds, so why would these people? The point here is, is the point here to note is that nodes exist as part of a network. Each node is connected to a previous node and all nodes eventually collect, connect to towns. If you connect an entire stretch of nodes together between two towns or two cities or between a city and a town, vice versa, then news of your heroism, or at the very least, <laughs> news of your proactive helpfulness, <laughs> will, will spread between those areas. So what's the point of all this? Why does it matter if people know of you, as expressed in the form of invested contribution points in nodes? Well, the first advantage is trade, and this is just the first of many advantages. Uh, the trade system in Black Desert Online involves a simple principle. If you pick up an object and take it a great distance, it'll sell for more than if you sold it locally. It follows, then, that a great way to make money is to simply buy or pick up something in one town, then run it down to the next town and sell it to the local trader for profit. Well, this is only profitable if you have a linked network of nodes along your trade route. Traders and marketeers do not trust individuals who are unknown. For this reason, if you try to transport and sell goods from one town to another, and you have not connected all of the nodes spanning between these two towns, the trader will not know who you are and will not trust that the that you actually got the goods or received the goods from where you claim you got them from. They will therefore only pay you 30% of the item's worth because they can't verify the fact that this is genuine. If, however, all the nodes are linked between the two trade areas, they will have heard of your exploits, they will trust you, and they will pay full price because, well, they trust that, yeah, you say it comes from this town, I believe you. Now, uh, have a watch as I do a little bit of tra trading. Here's another extract from my, uh, from my, from one of my games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just arrived, man. Um, yeah, I've just arrived. I'm about to do a trading run, big trucker. It's gonna be, it's gonna be good. Um, these are all other traders around me at the moment. Okay, seriously, this is a horse fest. We've got everything. Look at that a little donkey with a pack. Okay. There's all of these carts around the place, some of them holding weapons and everything else. Check out my little cart. Hang on a second, I've got to get it free of all of this stuff. Just give us a moment. Alright, I bought this. I bought this cart. You just buy it from any stable. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible little thing, but it's a start. I bought this horse, which is great. I had to buy the stirrups and everything for it. Now I've got a little cart, and I'm about to do a trade run. Now what I've done, I'll just show you this big trucker. I've actually linked up all of the nodes, right, going down here. So basically, this is what I had to do. I had to go from, basically, I, I went to Bartali Farm. So I linked up the node there, and I've actually got some workers there now. Linked up this one at Balanos Forest, which is pretty cool. Um, what else? Uh, continuing on, yeah. Then I went to Heidel Pass. These guys are expensive. They cost like three contribution points. Anyway, I kept on going down here. Then the Northern Guard Camp, another three. Then I got to here to Heidel. So I could actually just do a trade route straight to, straight to Heidel. But then I had to. Li uh, then I linked it up with Costa Farm across the bridge. Costa Farm, sorry, across the bridge. Then to the Central Guard Camp, and then all the way down to Glish. So I can actually run the complete route down here, and I get full price because I've linked it all up. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Bit of effort went into this man. Bit of effort. <laughs> no, there's no such thing as too much effort. Alright, so... So I've, so I've got the wagon. I've got everything I need. Now I'm going to buy something here and hopefully sell it for a greater amount at my destination. So yeah. Yeah, uh, if, if I... Liara, if I tried to sell it, I would only get... Um, I'd only get 30% of the cost if I hadn't got the nodes all linked up because they wouldn't know who I was. Oh my god. This horse is so ungainly. Jeez, it's like... Arrgh, okay, and stop. Done. Alright, now we're going to get off the cart. 
Leave it parked there, and we're going to talk to the Trade Master, and we're going to buy some stuff. Nope, that would be a trade bundle. Nope, that's the merchant. We're after the trade manager. There he is. I'm a merchant. I even bargain in my dreams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't think he dreams about that either. I think he's just having us on. Oh, God, what? Okay, so apparently after logging in, we have to wait. All right, so we're going to have to wait for a bit, everybody. We're going to have to wait. All right, all right, right. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. All right. So this time it should work. I'm hoping. Yes, it does. All right, everybody. So this is what we're going to be doing. Down here we've got the weight we've got now. I'm only able to carry 23.6. Um, is that l liters? I'm not really sure what that is. Whatever that is. Anyway, so we'll say pounds. I can t I can carry 23.6 pounds. I'm only a little girl. Um, now. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to buy Bartelli's Odd Adventure. It's a book. I can buy luxuries if I wanted to, but I need trade artisan. I need like levels and different things. I could I could export chicken or even some wine actually. Let's have a look at the market price of wine in different areas. Yeah, it's going to take one en uh, energy to actually view this. All right, so let's have a look down the list here. All right, um, okay, Gith. I'm after Gith or whatever it is. Olva. Make 101, 103. The Western Guard Camp, Finto Farm. Mm, not really, not really where I'm going. I'm after a much bigger pro profit margin than that. What about this? Okay, so we'll escape. And we'll go back into trade again. I should have just gone for a turn. All right. Um, what about this one? Market price. Yes, I'll spend some energy. All right. Okay. Gish, here we are. Okay, no, we'll lose we'll lose money there. Actually, I am gonna go and take another look at this, even though I'm wasting a little bit. Okay, market price, yes please. Alright. Gish. 99. So I still lose money. They're not they're not inputting it. Oh my god, what the hell is that cat doing? Alright, so we're gonna go to return. So let's 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 stick to the books. So let's look at the market price here, yes please. Alright, uh Gish. Okay, we get a hundred and five profit. Alright, so we make five percent profit. On this, so that's what we're going to do, everybody. We're going to we're going to buy a whole heap of these now. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take. I'll, um, I actually got to return. All right, so I'm going to take say ten of these. Okay, that. Oh no, 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 that's okay. We've got three hundred and sixty pounds worth of worth of weight. This is only three hundred and fifty-four, so we can take ten of these books and take them down to uh, to to Glith. All right, so let's do that. So we're going to purchase all. Alright, so your mount is nearby. Yes, please. Alright, done. Alright, yeah, while you're traveling with items, you can encounter bandits. Oh, we don't fear any bandits, do we? Alright, now I've got to get back on this damn thing. Alright, so... Now, there should actually be produce in the back of my wagon now. So let's get out. Let's get into the clear. Alright, so let's have a little look. Alright, yeah, yeah, we've got stuff in the back of the wagon. Okay, I'm only supposed to be transporting books, but that's symbolized apparently by bags of food. But anyway, uh, we're ready to go. So let's look at the map. We're about to br uh, begin our trade run all the way down to here. All right, so let's do it. And I'm now pressing T, and we're off, everyone. And there it is. get off this thing. Alright, so we can now go up to here. Hey! Oh, I have a quest. <laughs> Another rookie. <laughs> Don't call me a rookie. Would you care to give my porters some direction? Alright, um, no, not after you insulted me. Alright, so now that I'm here, as you can see, I can actually sell stuff. Alright, now if I try to sell these coins, Max, okay, okay. Alright, I can do that. Alright. Now let's, uh, let's sell the, uh, I'm now selling these books over here for 105% of their original price, and I have completed my trade run. And there it is. There, I've made a little, made a little bit of a profit, 5% on each manuscript, which is really good. I'm uh, slowly building up my my profit margin. Yeah, I know it isn't that much. I've only just started trading. Okay, ooh, we've got a couple of trade quests here as well, which is awesome. All right, so 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, succeeded in our first trade mission. Alright, so let's go and do some combat now, shall we? But wait, there's more. Once you have invested your first point into a node, you can then invest more points into it to get special favours, like a farmer allowing you to farm his plantation or a local miner allowing you to mine his claim. This will allow you to hire workers and have them begin harvesting nodes for you. That's right, most of the NPCs you see walking around are actually working for players. So, I've spent a contribution point to make myself known to the node master, as we previously explained, and I've spent an additional point to unlock, say, a chicken coop. Okay, so how do I hire a worker to collect eggs and harvest chicken meat while I'm off adventuring? Well, in every major town there'll be a labor master, basically a worker vendor. Go here. It'll cost energy, uh, sorry, before I go on, they're, they're symbolized by a little uh, pickaxe. Okay, so if you see a little pickaxe on the map, that's the local labor master. Go here. It'll cost energy to preview, to preview a worker, usually five energy, and money to hire a worker. If the worker has a gray name, they are below average. If the worker has a green name, they are average. If the worker has a blue name, you've struck gold, congratulations, and you have a good worker, but they're very rare. There are three races of workers, including goblins, humans, and giants. Goblins harvest quickly, but are less efficient in the long term. Giants harvest slowly, but are more efficient in the long term. And humans are kind of in the middle. In every town, your first worker will basically be content to live on the streets and not require housing. However, every worker after the first will require special lodging. Lodging requires that you purchase a house or a room in town, something that will require both money and contribution points. To purchase a house, go to the map, uh, go to the map, click on the town that you want to purchase the house in, and click on Goblins one of the blue house away. icons. Those These are rooms you can no afford. Spirit. The grey rooms, you can also get later, they usually cost more contribution points than you currently have, so are greyed out. But you can still click on them and see what they offer. Look for a house that has lodging as one of its functions. Not every house will have lodging as a function. You'll also notice a number of triangles or arrows next to all the functions. These represent how Ours often that type of room can be upgraded. Up so it's obviously better to buy a room for lodging us. that has many of these as many of these triangles as possible so that it can be upgraded to the greatest extent. Because it's more efficient that way. If you like upgrade at three levels, then you can maybe have six workers in the one room as opposed to just one. Uh, so it's cheaper, more effective, more economical. Once you've purchased a room, you can hire a new worker. Yay, now you've got two workers. So you get the general idea. You need rooms, t uh, lodging, to keep your workers happy. Alright, so go back to the node you unlocked. In the example I gave before, it was a chicken coop, so like this one here, and click on it. You'll have to go back to the node manager for this, so you'll have to go back and talk to the person. You can't do it, just do it remotely on the map. If you have available workers, it will give you the opportunity to commit workers to that part of the node. Now your worker is working. You can even see them traveling around the map and go up to talk and go up and talk to them if you want to. You can actually see them moving around. They become a living, breathing part of this world. They're not just a sequence of numbers that run in the background and give you periodic bonuses. So it's really interesting. They can also be attacked on the road as well. They can suffer attrition, all sorts of crazy stuff. But wait, nodes do don't stop there. Okay, for a start, controlling a node means that creatures in the area drop loot more frequently. So if you're grinding for XP or items, invest in a local node. Also, you can invest even more points into a node, just like you did the did it the first time through the node master, in order to increase the loot bonuses you receive. And again, one more thing. There's always one more thing. See these little red shields with little little red cross swords uh, in the middle? These indicate the nodes are not currently possessed by a clan. Uh, or a guild, I should say. If a guild does ever possess a node, the shield will be replaced by their guild insignia, and you'll be taxed for passing through the area, for conducting commerce in the area, etc. See? Nodes are a very, very important part of the game. Look, everybody, there's so much more to this game, but I do have to draw a line somewhere between an introductory guide and what would be a depth strategy overview. And the line is here. I want to thank you all for watching and I hope you found it educational. This is what I personally would have loved to have been told before starting play. So thank you very much everybody and take care. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of footage of my character because all of this maintenance stuff in the background, like this is all, that's all background stuff that I've told you here. It's good to know it to get started. 
But the real fun, of course, is in combat and grinding and things like that. So, uh, at least for me. It may not be for you, but I just want to finish this little video with, uh, well, actually, probably what is quite a large video now, with a bit of footage of my character's dress getting amazingly bloody and torn up as I slash my way through insurmountable enemies and uh, and move my way to victory. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great and a glorious game. I hope to see you out there, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Yeah.